Eagerly Waiting for Our Savior has been our theme this month. And um, so accordingly, we had last Sunday a lesson on the Day of the Lord, Old Testament background, but New Testament passages where that expression is found. But our emphasis was on, and, and we, we, I think we felt a little bit of surprise at just how many passages talk about looking forward to this, eagerly waiting this, and, and the, the idea of expectation and desiring this. And so that we, we saw that God wants us to look at this as something that, that with His help we're fully prepared for and we're not fearful about. That is 1 John 4, 17 says that we may appear on the day of judgment without fear, with, with boldness. And so we, we, we saw that as we looked at the day of the Lord. And then last Sunday evening we talked about events that will transpire at the second coming. And um, again, just going through the scriptures dealing with that. This morning we were privileged to talk about heaven, how beautiful heaven must be, but what makes heaven beautiful? And so we, look, we explored that. Tonight I want to look at a, a question that I think probably all of us have had, and we want to know what the Bible teaches. Since we're talking about the doctrine of last things and what will occur with the Lord's coming, I'm looking at a related question tonight, and that is, where are the dead? What happens at the point of death? And where are the dead? Of course, we're not talking about where the body might be buried. But the real you, the real self, that, that inner man, that real person, we're, we're asking the question, where are the dead? And so, tonight, we, uh, we raise that question. And for our first passage of Scripture... We're turning to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. We'll look at several verses tonight. But we're starting again with Luke chapter 16. Jesus in verse 19. Let's just read together if if, if that would be I think a good way to start. Are you with me? Luke 16 verse 19. We're answering the question. We're asking and letting the Bible answer the question. Where are the dead? Now remember, as we begin our reading, Jesus is the one, remember how He identifies Himself in the book of Revelation? That He's the one that has the keys of death and Hades? So He knows about death and Hades. Uh, He is the one that has overcome death and given us the victory. So when we read about what Jesus said, of course He's speaking with authority and He knows these things. And so we proceed. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Don't confuse him with the Lazarus who's the brother of Mary and Martha, by the way. Full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things And likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to them, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now, before the lesson uh, is, is done, I do want to come back to this passage in terms of some some other lessons that we may learn. But for the present time, for now, I'm simply wanting to notice 
that what we have here are the two realms that Lazarus, when he died, was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. I mentioned this morning in, in Hebrews 1 and verse 14 that angels are ministering spirits sent forth on behalf of those that are heirs of salvation. And to me this is such a beautiful picture that in life, in life God has promised never to forsake us. And the psalmist said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And that's in life. But in death, what comfort there is in that we're never left alone, that God sends his angels. And so the um, angels carried him to this place, Abraham's bosom, a place of paradise. On the other hand, the rich man, and by the way, again, you let scripture interpret scripture. And, and no, no scripture is going to indicate that somebody is saved just because he's poor. And so it's not telling you. But, but one may be poor and be rich spiritually and make good choices, and that's what is involved. It's implicit in the passage, and we're constrained to that understanding because of other texts, of course. And likewise, the rich man is not lost because he's rich. But he's ungodly. He doesn't care about spiritual things. He has opportunities, for example, right there at his doorstep, so to speak, to help Lazarus, and he doesn't do any of that. And so he's, he's living without God, and he dies without God. And it just says the rich man died and was buried. Nothing said about angels carrying him anywhere. The rich man died and was buried. That's the body. But then when it says lifting up his eyes being in torments, that's referring, of course, to the soul. Now, in the conversation that takes place with Abraham and the rich man where he is asking, first thing he asks for is for help for himself. Since nothing could be done to remedy his situation, it's interesting he doesn't think of other people first. He asks about himself first, but then he asks about his brothers. Let somebody go send Lazarus to talk to him, them so they don't come to this place. And uh, what you see with all of that is this point, that between us and you, verse 26, there's a great gulf fixed. It's interesting that this word for gulf is the word cosma. And this is the word from which we get the word chasm. We know what a chasm means. And so there's a great chasm that is fixed that cannot be crossed over. So this, it's not a case that... Uh, you're going to have one leaving one realm and going to another realm. So Abraham says that that cannot be done. And so here again, this is, a, this is the situation at the point of death. We're asking, where are the dead? And someone who dies in a saved relationship, the spirit goes to this place of paradise. But the spirit of the lost goes to another place. That is a place where one is aware that he's separated from God. He's separated from all that is good. So, um, as, we, as, we proceed, uh, as we proceed further with that concept, when Jesus was on the cross, you remember when the penitent thief said, Lord, remember me. This is Luke 23. When you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him in verse 43, Verily I say unto thee, today you will be with me in paradise. And so this is telling us that Jesus, who was about to give up his spirit, knew that the spirit would go to the paradise of God. But he's also telling the, the penitent thief, the one who repented, that that is where he would be. You will be with me in paradise. Now, interestingly, in that first gospel sermon, Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is talking about the resurrection of Christ. But when he mentions first his death and then the fact that it was not possible for death to hold him, he quotes from the Davidic Psalm of Psalm 16 that among other things had prophesied in verse 27, because you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And so this realm of Hades, the word, it's important for us to see the word Hades just means, it's a Greek word that just means the unseen realm. It refers to the place of departed spirits. And it's the equivalent of the Hebrew word Sheol, 
which has the same idea. And so it doesn't tell you by itself if a person is saved or lost. I say that because the rich man lifted up his eyes in Hades, but he was in a lost condition. But here Jesus referred to the fact that he would be going to paradise in Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And yet Peter quotes where the, the psalmist has said, You will not leave your, my soul in Hades, nor will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. And now I grew up cutting my teeth and memorizing from the King James translation. Many of you still use that, and it's a good translation. But you need to know, for example, right here in, uh, in the King James Version, if you use that, it says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. And so what happens is that the King James translators, I just mentioned this in the passing, but the King James translators translated the Eng used the English word hell to describe both Gehenna, the place of punishment, but also that's what they rendered for the word Hades. And that's not a problem just so you know what, what it's talking about. In other words, in Acts 2 it's not saying Jesus went to hell, the place of punishment, but it's saying that He went to that realm called Hades, which of course is paradise, the paradise of God. So Jesus at His death referred to going to paradise. Peter said that this was Hades, His soul was not left in that realm, but He was raised from the dead of course on the third day. And there are passages that would also come into play describing uh, the, this place of torment. For example, in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. 2 Peter 2 verse 4 says, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and this is another word, this is the Greek word Tartarus, but it's talking about angels. Cast them to Tartarus, deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So it's not everlasting punishment. Gehenna is reserved, Matthew 25 verse 41, that's a place prepared for the devil and his angels. This is not that. This is talking about a place where these wicked, these fallen angels are, as the text says, reserved for judgment. And so this would be the same place that uh, the rich man was, reserved for judgment. And verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. That is describing what this realm is for those who die in a lost condition. God reserves the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And very similarly in the one chapter book of Jude and in verse 6. Jude in verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own habitation, He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So again this, this would be commentary on Luke 16 in terms of, of this place where the rich man went. These passages like 2 Peter 2, Jude verse 6 help us to see what that is about. But in the lesson this month, even though what God has said about those who do not obey the Gospel, and what God has said about the lost is very important. And we cannot sugarcoat that. We cannot leave that out. We must preach the whole counsel of God. Yet there is a time and a place, and that's where we're coming from this month, in which what we're emphasizing is the, the, the beauty of the promises, the good things that will happen to the people of God, and what God has prepared for those who love Him, for those that love His appearing. And so it's right for us to take some time, just as sometimes passages do, some passages to the exclusion of dealing with what's going to happen to the lost, such as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 are just talking about what God has in store for a child of God at the second coming. So again we, we must present both sides of this, but where I'm wanting, what I'm wanting to emphasize tonight is really what's involved for a child of God, promises for a child of God when He is taken from this life. By the way you, you see in my heading for this slide reference to the paradise of God. Where I got that expression is found in Revelation 2 and verse 7. You have the seven churches of Asia receiving these letters, seven churches of Asia Minor. Keegan, that's a Roman province, seven churches of Asia. 
And Ephesus is the first church, the church in the city of Ephesus is the first one of the letters of the seven. And all of them conclude with a wonderful promise. And verse 7 to Ephesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the true, I'm sorry, from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so that's, each one of these verses talk about overcoming. He that overcomes. But it also gives a special promise. They're all different. But these are promises. And here the first one is eating from the midst of the paradise of God. Of course that takes you back to the beginning. Paradise was lost in the garden. And so here we have the reference to the paradise of God that is here promised. Now I want to, I want to explore that though just a bit further. Again looking at what happens at the point of death. And I want you to think carefully with me. I'm turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And what I ask is that you study this and see what you think. And, and I, I do believe that uh, we, we learn some things here about the paradise of God that are things that are very encouraging when we think about what happens when a Christian passes from this life. And it's right for us to be, to, to look at these passages and let them have the desired effect of giving us joy and confidence and assurance. God wants us to have that blessed assurance. So Paul is doing something he doesn't like to do because they're comparing himself, him, Paul, with others and putting Paul on the short end of the stick. You know, he's not really a genuine apostle. I mean, if you've read 2 Corinthians, you know that sort of thing is going on. And Paul says, you know, I hate to do this, but if you want to make comparisons, let me tell you some things that I've experienced. And one of the things that he mentions here in verse 2, at first he's using the third person, like I knew someone, but then he shifts to the first person, so you know he's talking about himself. But he says in verse 2 that, that uh, such a one, the latter part of verse 2, was caught up to the third heaven. And in regard to being caught up to the third heaven, in verse 4, he says how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for a man to utter. And so he, he goes on to again shift to the third person, verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure. I mean to be caught up to the very paradise of God and see the things that he saw. And when he says it's not lawful to utter, that means he did not have permission from God to say what he saw. That's what that means. But he said that was such a, uh, well, how can words fail me? A unique experience, wonderful experience, I mean, unheard of experience. And he said, actually, God sent me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And, you know, what is implicit is, by the way, which, which one of you have been caught up to the third heaven? You know, you're wanting, you're wanting to make comparisons with the Apostle Paul, he would say, and, and he's, he's inferior somehow. By the way, how many times have you experienced that? And of course, other, other things as well. But uh, so there's a context there. But I'm talking about he was caught up to the third heaven, he was caught up into paradise. I do, I do not, first of all, I, I would say this I don't believe that the word paradise is being used in different ways. I think consistently that when Paul says he was caught up into paradise, it's the same as Revelation 2 verse 7, the paradise of God. And it's the same as Luke 23 verse 43, when Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. I, I don't think we're shifting gears to some different meaning. And it's called in verse 2, the latter part, the third heaven. What does that mean, the third heaven? Well, again, to answer questions like that, we simply study the Scriptures and see how the Bible uses the term. Number one, there's the first heaven. For example, in the book of Genesis, the first chapter, when it talks about the, the birds that God created, they're the birds of the heavens. And so, the, the, the birds of, that, that's the atmosphere where they fly. That's the first heaven. But also in the book of Genesis, reference is made to the sun, moon, and stars that are located, they're positioned in the, in the heavens. They're in heaven to give light by day and light by night. But that's the second heaven. 
the third heaven to which Paul refers here is the very paradise of God. That's the dwelling place of God. Now, what we're looking at is the very immediate presence of God and Christ when we speak of paradise. Mike Willis made this statement that I had not seen put exactly that way, but he says when God is speaking, or when, the script, when Paul speaks of the intermediate state of the righteous dead, fellowship with Christ is its sole content. In other words, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, which is listed here, that to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. In other words, if you're on the earth, you're in the body. But if you're a Christian and you're out of the body, you are with the Lord. And then in Philippians 1, which we have here at verse 23, that's where Paul said, uh, you know, I have a desire to stay and to help out with you, but I have a desire to depart. But he says, for me to depart is to be with Christ. And uh, I appreciated what uh, Brother Willis said when he said there's no speculation about the nature of existence with Christ. In other words, it just states the fact. For me to depart is to be with Christ. If we're absent from the body, we're at home with the Lord. He doesn't, uh, you know, explain in what sense that is or what that means. But what he's saying is it's fellowship with Christ. That's the sole content. In other words, when the child of God leaves this body, he is with the Lord. He is with Christ. He's at home with the Lord. For me to depart is to be with Christ. Let's look also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says here we know that if our earthly house, that's the body, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven, if indeed having been clothed we shall not be found naked. So the idea of naked here is, is an unclothed spirit, a disembodied spirit. You know, I mean it's not using the word naked in the sense of nudity in any ordinary sense like that. But it's saying at death what you have is a spirit that is unclothed because it's outside of the tent, it's outside of the body. So in verse 4, we who are in this tent groan, being burdened. We know there's something better beyond this life. But he says it's not that we just want to be unclothed. It's not that a Christian is saying, I just want to die. I just want to leave here. It's not because we want to be unclothed. That's when the spirit leaves the body. But he says what we want is to be further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. And so he continues, He who prepared us for this very thing is God who's given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And so again, being always confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We're talking tonight about the paradise of God. And so what Paul says is, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. That's when you die. But then he looks ahead to the day of the resurrection and the judgment in verse 10 when he says, We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether it be good or bad. And so I'm simply stressing that when we look at what happens to a Christian when he dies, these passages are telling us that if we're absent from the body, we're at home with the Lord. For me to depart is to be with Christ. That what we're doing is we're, we're going to the paradise of God. Now sometimes people have a problem with that. It's like, well, you, you mean they're in heaven already? And, and well, the point of it is, it's, the, it's, the, it's not permanent in the sense that that's the spirit that is awaiting the day of the resurrection. But to think of it as some other place where God is not, again goes outside the bounds of Scripture. So what happens is, think in terms of the Spirit going to be with the Lord, and then awaiting the resurrection. The hour is coming, in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Paul says, I believe just what the Scriptures say, the prophets say, 
But there will be there will be a resurrection both of the just and of the unjust. Now, in the passage we I guess refer to every lesson in Philippians chapter three. This doesn't take away from what we said. What happens at the point of death? When Paul says our citizenship is in heaven, verse twenty, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are we doing? Remember, we're eagerly waiting for the Savior. In the meantime, if we pass from this life, where are we? At home with the Lord, carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Today you will be with me in paradise. All those passages tell us where the soul departs at death. But what we're doing is we're eagerly waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when He comes, what happens? Verse 21 He will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. Don't you see how this brings things together? So this is talking, it's taking up with however time the Lord delays his coming, however much time, that soul is taken care of. That soul is in the paradise of God. That soul has departed, he's at home with the Lord. But that's not the end. That's not the eternal state of glorification. Philippians 3 shows what we're waiting for. And it also links back to what we said in 2 Corinthians 5. When he talks about we have that building made with God eternal in the heavens, he's not talking about what happens when you die. He's talking about what happens when the Lord comes. That's when the resurrection will occur and this body will be made like His glorious body. And you can put with that 1 John chapter 3 where John would say there, we know not what we shall be, but we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as he is. And so passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read that last Sunday evening in connection with events that will tra- transpire at the second coming. Tonight I, I, I'm not going to take the time to read the whole passage, but notice how some of the wording here will relate to what we have said even tonight. Again, at the Lord's coming, The text tells us in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. What does that mean? What, how is God going to bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus? Well, what that means is they've gone to be with the Lord. These are the departed spirits. They're in the paradise of God. For me to depart is to be with Christ. But at the second coming, All those that are in that situation, the Lord will bring with Him. Because what will happen is, there will be a resurrection of the body reunited with that spirit. And so that that also is, is significant right there. As well as he talks about those, verse 17, who are alive and remain. So those that have not died, our spirits have not gone yet. The text says, we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. There are two things I underlined in my Bible in that verse. One is when it says, we shall be caught up together with them. This morning I made the point that one of the things that makes heaven so attractive and so beautiful is that thought of when all God's singers get home, that we're sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with those who have gone on before us, all the saints of God, And so what what this text is saying is we shall be caught up, and here's what I underline, together with them. And so that's that's held out as a wonderful promise. These that have passed on, their spirits are returning with the Lord to be reunited with the resurrected body, and we will be together with them. Not away from them, but with them. Second thing I underlined is thus we shall always be with the Lord. And that's the most important thing. Remember, that's what makes heaven so attractive, being with the Lord. And so, again, passages that I'll just refer to, 1 John 3 and verse 2, and first, the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15 deals with this. But what it's talking about is what happens at the resurrection. And the body will be raised. But that spirit has been, has been taken by the angels, we're talking about Christians, to be with the Lord. To depart is to be with Christ. Today you will be with me in paradise. And so they're awaiting the time that these passages speak of in regard to the resurrection. And of course when the resurrection occurs, 
as we said last Sunday night, that's when you have, at the same time, the day of judgment. And so, again, for our purpose tonight, some of you are taking notes. If you're not, I'll be, and, and want these, I'll be glad to share the PowerPoint with you. But passage after passage talks about, at this point of the man wants to die, and after this is the judgment. Matthew 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And all the nations shall be divided before Him as a shepherd, shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And so He talks about that coming day of judgment there. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body. Romans 14, Jude, verse 14 and 15, talk about that coming day of judgment. So, the Spirit departs to be with the Lord. On the day of the resurrection, the Spirit is reunited with that new, spiritual, incorruptible, glorious body. The judgment of all then occurs. Now, I wonder what you're thinking tonight so far. Are you thinking, wow, this is pretty complex. Are you thinking that? This is, this is uh, upper division stuff. This is really advanced. It would be easy for us to think that. But I want to suggest to you that in Hebrews chapter 6, when the inspired writer is talking about the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, notice in verse 2 that he lists the doctrine of baptisms, plural, the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Because at judgment we enter into eternity. But all of this, everything listed in those first two verses, that's called first principles. It's not, a, it's not an advanced Bible study course. And so if you, if you know the doctrine of the resurrection, I take that to mean you'd have to know what happens, like we talked about tonight, to the soul at the point of death. And then biblical teaching on the resurrection and biblical teaching on the judgment. It's just that uh, we need to see that inspiration says these are still first principle things. It's foundational. So you get this, you got the good foundation, but you don't stop there. This doesn't make you some Bible expert. You keep building on that. We sometimes set the bar so low. God's saying, no, this is just first principle. I want you to soar. I want you to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to draw this to a close. But I said I'd like to revisit Luke chapter 19. I'm just going to give you this kind of as bullet points. It's interesting, once we see positive, in a positive way what a text is saying, it's interesting to see sometimes how many errors a passage will refute. For example, if you talked with a Jehovah's Witnesses group, they believe that at the point of death there's no consciousness, there's no existence. And so this, this refutes that. Abraham, uh, the, the, Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom, and he's conscious, he's aware, he has his identity. See, death does not destroy one's identity. It does not destroy one's consciousness. And related to that, but it refutes materialism. The doctrine is that that which is material, that's, that's all there is. That's not true. In fact, the most important things are not material. The most important things are what you can't see, not what you can. Also, some have advanced the idea of soul sleeping. The idea being that once you die, the soul just sleeps. It just has a long sleep until the day of the resurrection. That's not true. Uh, again, there's consciousness. There is awareness that we see on the part of both the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. Another thing that's refuted is the doctrine of universalism. You may know that the doctrine of universalism is that ultimately everyone will be saved. And the Bible does not teach that. And this, of course, refutes that. Another thing that's very common in this, days of, in this day of occult and, and all of the practices that go along with that is the idea of necromancy. And that's the idea. The word necro has to do with death. And the latter part of the word means actually prophecy. But what that word refers to is those who think that they on earth that are living can communicate with the dead. And it doesn't work that way. Those that are dead cannot communicate with the living. And those that are living cannot communicate with the dead. But a lot of people believe that. And they'll pay money, you know, to go to these palm readers and all that sort of thing. Another thing is the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. The doctrine of purgatory is that a person is going to be subject to the grace of God, but he dies not really in an okay position. There are still sins that he has, but with God's grace in the process of time while he's in 
purgatory, these sins are going to be remitted, and ultimately then, he can then be among the saved. And so this, of course, refutes that. There's no such thing taught in the Bible, one is either a saved or a lost condition. Another thing we see is the use of the Scriptures to convert, the idea of a direct operation of the Spirit, that God is going to do something else to convert these brothers is just not there. One other thing is that we all get to choose. The rich man made his choices. And the idea that God, as the, the Calvinists might teach, that he has predestined that this one will be lost, this one will be saved without any choice on his own. Taking away from man that freedom of choice is not taught in the Scriptures. Bring this to a close. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. And so my admonition is, let us live faithfully in the Lord and die in the Lord. Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, Be thou faithful even unto death, and I will give the crown of life. 14, 13, Blessed are those who die in the Lord. But if you want to die in the Lord, you must live in the Lord. And finally, Moses, who wrote the 90th Psalm, said, The days of our years are threescore and ten. If by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, it is soon cut off and we fly away. Verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So there's a day coming, a day of judgment. There's a day coming, the day of our death. And let's number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I, I find such comfort in these passages that showing the loving care that God gives when those who are His people depart from this life immediately, right away, as well as when we look ahead to the good things that will happen at the second coming of Christ. You've listened well tonight, and I appreciate that. If there is anyone tonight who is not in right relationship with God, you need to obey the gospel, or you've strayed away and you need to be restored, trust and obey as we stand and sing.